Steady, steady, now steady, close up at the back. Steady, steady. All right, come on! Oh. The jockeys. Every day they ignore the dangers of their occupation. They could be in the winner's circle after one race and in an ambulance after the next. A jockey puts his life on the line every time he rides. It's the ultimate test of an athlete's will. He's blind to fear and risks death. All for the chance to return a winner. It truly takes a cup of courage. I like to liken it to a, uh, a bucket of water. You have a ladle that is your courage, and each time you ride in a race, you take the ladle and pick out a bit of courage, and when you start out, it's pretty easy. The ladle fills up pretty easily, and you drop it out. You spill stuff on this, spill it, splash it around. It doesn't make any difference because there's still plenty there. I think the older you get, the more difficult it becomes to fill that ladle up. There's nothing quite like riding a thoroughbred in full flight. There's nothing that can, can compare with that. I guess it's the challenge, the competition of, uh, of so many people trying to be the best. And it's the only sport when you don't have uh, uh, people to help you. Like in baseball, you got nine guys on your side, nine against you. This is the only sport when you compete against 10 horses. It's you against nine and nine against you. You have no partner. There's a danger every time you get on, a, especially on a racehorse. Uh, they're strong, powerful horses. Uh, every time you go out on the racetrack, anything can happen. Even if, even if you're in control, someone else can always uh, hit you or run into you or something can happen at any time. They're asked to get up on a 1100, 1200 pound horse that they know very little about. Uh, in many cases, they're, they're, they're legged up on a horse and they don't realize the soundness of that horse, or, and maybe even the trainers don't realize that there might be a nagging uh, problem or even a slight uh, stress crack in the cannon bone that could cost them a, a serious injury. So I don't think it's something that they think about every day. I don't think it's something that they go out and say, gosh, I hope I have an injury-free day. But I think it's something that is there and ever-present on every horse they get up on, and they're to be commended that they, as I say, put it on the line every day, race one through nine. They really enjoy the ups and the highs and the successes. Uh, it's, of course, a very physically dangerous, but they're very well compensated for it. As daredevil activities go, I think it's one of the better ones. There's an excitement as the starting gate opens. The chance to win is at hand. But the ever-present danger of the sport is always close behind. This is the only sport where an ambulance follows the competitors. You know, I was doing what I wanted to do. I always wanted to be a jockey, and that's what I wanted to do. I got 40, I think 44 broken bones. But, you know, they hurt at times, and, and you, you have to pay for what you did. I, I really feel that I was fortunate. I'm not paralyzed. I did lose the hearing in one ear. I can see out of both eyes. I can get around good. So I don't feel with the spills that I had that I was really that unfortunate. I think that I came out very well with it. The, you know, the extent of injuries I had, because uh, either one of the last two injuries could have killed me. First of all, it's a thrill to be in a horse, but then, then when you get on it, you be thinking about, you could get hurt so badly, you could be in a hospital, and you could be uh, dead. It starts early in the morning. I get up about 4.30 usually in the morning. And I'll get up and freshen up a little bit and get a cup of tea or coffee. And go out and get in my car and go to the track. And usually by about 5, 5.15, I'll be there. And I'll walk to some of the, the barns, my clients' uh, barns, and see if they need any help that morning to exercise the animals that hopefully I'll be riding in the next week or two. Uh, you're out there in the morning trying to get those mounts. Hello, Nacho. How are you? 
Okay, pretty good. Ready? Ready. Come on, girl. It's a great feeling to have a horse underneath you. I mean, you're about a, anywhere from 100 to 110 pounds, maybe 115 pounds at the most, and you've got a horse underneath you that's maybe 1,000 pounds, maybe more. And to know you're in, you're in command, it's, it's a great feeling to try and get them to do what you ask them to do and just hope they respond when you ask them to respond. If I can find a few more that run like her, we'll be doing all right. Every horse you get on, you're hoping you're going to be able to ride, and it doesn't always work that way, but that's what you're out there. That's the objective. Can I help you with anything, Mr. Drysdale? No, no, we're okay, thanks. Okay. Where's Joe at? Joe Garcia. Joe Garcia, right here. How we doing, guys? All right. You need any help this morning? I'm gonna go right now and talk to the last meal. We'll have something right after the break. You busy? No. Let me know though, okay? Because I'm gonna ask a few other people if you don't. Where are you going now? Okay. Just walk around, but I'll check back. Well, I'm gonna go down there and talk to the last right you now. You walking down or? Yeah. Oh, I'll go down. I'll go with you. Danny, just call me if you need some help tomorrow, okay? I'll be home for my answer machine to be on. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Aaron. See you later. Okay. Aaron is, I think, uh, a lot of people have compared him to shoemaker, a young shoemaker. I think he also has a lot of patience and is very serious about his career. Um, I think he's he's really looking at a great future ahead. I think he's one of the best young writers I've seen come along in quite a long time. Very sensible. Knows where he's going all the time, and a, and, a, and a gentleman. I'll get in the jocks room, and uh, if I don't ride the next race, I, I might go back and sit down and look at the racing form for the following race, and just sit there and study the horse that I'll ride, and see where where he his running style, where he where I feel he would like to be positioned at, and then look at the rest of the horses and just see how I think the race might be run. It's really a very unusual situation uh, to be in the same locker room with, with our boxes or lockers right next to each other, such as they are in a football, with a football team or a basketball team or hockey team. Right the, front. Very front. the difference is, however, that we're competing against each other. We're not competing um, for each other or with each other. We're, we're competing against each other, and we're always trying to outdo the, outdo the next guy. Horses usually carry less than 120 pounds a race. That includes the jockey, his clothing, and saddle. For many jockeys, dieting is a daily concern. Some use the latest diet fad or fasting or reducing in the sweat box. 42-year-old Lafitte Pinkai Jr. has fought the battle with his weight his entire career. To maintain his weight at 117 pounds, he exists on one carefully prepared meal a day. The problem with me is that uh, I wasn't born to be a writer. I, I, I probably should have been a boxer or something like that. I have a, I have a body or uh, not a writer. You know, I tend to be very big. And uh, that's what has been bothering me to my career, that I have to find a way to keep my weight down and at the same time keep my strength up. In five days, if I lead like regular, you know, I will go to about 132, 135 pounds in five days, just eating, no overdoing it, just regular, I bet on it. 
I think that the thing that separates La, probably Lafitte from the other writers is the fact that he has so much dedication to the game and intensity. I, I think that all great athletes probably uh, have a great deal of intensity and dedication, but uh, he seems to be just a little bit above the rest of them. Uh, he's low-key, quiet to be around, uh, a great friend, but once you leg him up on a horse, I think his whole personality changes. He's such a fierce competitor. And one of the things that sets him apart, I think, that it makes it interesting about him is the fact that he has to diet and he fights his weight so hard. Lafitte and I, uh, uh, a few years ago, were traveling on a, a trip back east. We were going back from California to New York to ride in a stakes race. And uh, we were flying first class. And of course, the minute we got on the airplane, the stewardess were uh, pampering us and bringing us hors d'oeuvres and everything. And of course, Lafitte's sitting there and he's got this weight problem. So I have a weight problem, but I don't worry about it. So I'm looking there and I'm eating all the things that they bring me and I'm eating Lafitte's too and uh, so from the time we get in the air till the time they start to serve the meal I think we have about five or six hors d'oeuvres and then we get the salad and the crackers and the cheeses and the shrimp and I'm eating everything they throw in front of me and Lafitte's just sitting there watching me and I keep saying Lafitte you want some of this and he says no so finally about halfway through the flight when I'm into my uh, filet mignon he uh, asked the stewardess to bring him a half a cup of bouillon. And he takes this half a cup of bouillon and he just sips a little bit of it and, and holds it in his mouth and then swallows it. And I'm looking over at him and I think, my gosh, what discipline, because I know we've been in the air four or five hours and he has to be hungry. Finally, afterwards, I've got a bag of peanuts sitting on my tray. Now I've had a chocolate sundae in front of him just prior to this. And he reaches over, and this is literally true, he reaches over and he takes one peanut, one actual peanut, and lays it on his tray with his bullion and sits there and looks at it a little while. And then, believe it or not, he splits the peanut and takes the half, puts that in his mouth, chews it for about two to three minutes, washes it down with some bullion, and leaves the other half on the tray. At that point, I knew that Lafitte Pinkai had the dedication to become a great rider. When I started riding, I, I made myself a promise that as long as I was going to be a rider, I'm going to be, be the best, the best I could. I try to keep horses on my mind all the time. With, now it's a little difficult because I'm getting older, and I, I think I want to enjoy life a little more. I try not to think about horses so much, and I'm more, I'm more easygoing. I take loose a lot easier than I did before, and. Uh, what I have done all through my life, a lot of sacrifices, but it has paid off because I had a good career and had a good life. And, and when I retire, I, I, I think I'm going to be satisfied with what I have done. The stress of riding is enormous. Pinkai, who's been competing for 25 years, often arrives at the jockey's room hours before the first race in order to relax with a rub down. Yeah, a little better, eh? Yeah, they do. You know why? I gave him a pretty late rest. Yeah. Well, because of the, the way they ride, a lot of the jockeys get a lot of tension in the um, upper leg and also the back, the upper back and the neck, so they're hunched over the horse a lot. That's primarily their, um, the areas that require the most work. There's nobody in, in the business that's won every race they've ridden. And you have to understand, you have to ride the losers to get the winners. And you never know which horse is going to run that particular day. I mean, there's horses that I've seen that are 30, 40 to 1 that maybe in the form look like they've gotten their shot, and they'll pop up and win by three lengths. So you just have to ride every horse with confidence and, and uh, never give up on them. Oh, done that old horse of George Hartson as I wrote it there. He was so good. All right, here we go. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Good. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Thank you. I usually let the horses tell me when they feel comfortable warming up. You can usually tell when they're loosened up, when they're warmed up enough. And uh, once we get to the gate, you just have to get them standing on their feet and make sure they're ready to break, because when, when that gate opens, 
There's no turning back and say, I want to do it again. When that gate opens, you better go. If I'm in on the lead, if I can break the horse length in front, it's, it's a great feeling because you know that they've got to go where you've already been. I guess to win, it's got to be the biggest thrill that any person could have because uh, even so that the horse is 80 or 85 percent uh, to win, and when you win a race, especially when you win a close race or when you win a big race, it's a thrill that you could really not explain to anybody. It's something that uh, you feel like you're sitting on top of the world. You, you accomplish something that, you know, it looks very tough to do it, but you go there and do it, and it seems easy for you when, it's, when it looks tough for other people. It's just great to get up every morning knowing you're going to do what you've always wanted to do. Uh, this is what I've, I've always wanted in life, and I'm fortunate enough to be able to achieve it. And uh, it's just exciting. I wake up in the morning happy, just waiting to go to work. And to me, it's not really work, even though it is. It's, I have such fun doing it. It's more like play to me. Top Corsage and Bulger Spring all broke well. Rakow, Polly, and Hairless Eras going to the lead. Now here comes Native Paster on the inside. Native Paster gets the lead. Golden Galaxy going through to race second. Silent Arrival is next. Etta Caronet on the inside. Five of them. Then American Feeling and Serve and Volley. I just hope someday a young rider can come in and sit, say, I like to watch Aaron Grider's style. You know that? That would make me feel good. I want to be able to learn so much from watching these riders that somebody can come in in, say, five, ten years and watch my style and maybe learn from it. That's my deal. Got up to be fourth. Hairless Eris is six lengths off the lead. Etta Caronet is down at the rail. On the outside of her comes Silent Arrival. Then back to American Feeling, Serve and Volley and Valid Allure. Bulger Spring on the outside of that. They come for home. Native Paster clear by three. Golden Galaxy. Jeannie Jones putting in her run down at the rail. An eighth of a mile to go now and still out there on the lead. We have Native Paster. Jeannie Jones coming to chase her home. Serve and Volley's flying late. At sixteenth of a mile to go, Native Paster hanging on. Jeannie Jones. Serve and Volley flying, but Jeannie Jones going to get there at the wire. Jeannie Jones wins it. Finishing second, Native Paster. Serve and Volley a close serve. When you come back, if you've won the race, everybody's happy around the winner's circle. The owners, the trainers, they're all greeting you. The grooms are very happy, and the exercise riders. And they're all shaking your hand, and, you know, it's a great feeling to, to win a race. Everybody's so excited, and that's what you're there for. That's the object of the game, is to get there first. It's hard to say how long your career is going to go. Maybe I'll get too big or maybe something will happen. You never know. You just have to wish for the best and uh, hope to stay healthy and everything. And I hope my weight stays down. And I'd like to ride as long as I could. I just love doing it and I, I can't see retiring at a young age. I always look at the replays when I get back in the jockey room. I watch the TV screen. We've got a head-on shot to where you can see everything that happened. And then we've got the regular shot, the pan view, the side views. And I like to watch both of those and 
even if I'm not in the race, I want to watch the replays and watch the other riders and see what went on in the race and what I can learn from that race. Uh, if I'm in the race, I like to watch myself and see how I can change to, not necessarily change, but how I can improve myself. Uh, I love to watch Lafitte Pinkai, Chris McCarron, Gary Stevens, riders like that, I, I love to watch on the screen. Only one jockey wins a horse race, and riders take daring chances to win while traveling at 40 miles an hour. When a jockey finds his path blocked at that speed, his instinct guides him to quick action he must take to prevent tragedy. I think the key time is when a jockey is on a horse that he knows he can win with, but is trapped and has to show discipline and not allowing his horse to cause a lot of trouble in that race because there's sometimes when you have to accept defeat because there's no place to go. That's just racing luck. And I think that's probably the most important attribute of a jockey is not to cause a problem and wait till next time if he's, if he's in a spot where he really can't get out. Now you have to be brave enough to go through small holes when they develop, especially if you have the horse. You have to have judgment enough to know whether you've got the horse to go through a hole. I've heard many jockeys state that uh, the hole opened, but it was going faster than his horse was. And this is one of those instances. Watch the horse in the pink silks near the rail, just behind the leaders. Jockey Corey Black is trying to guide his mount through on the inside, but he finds his path blocked. If he had tried to fight his way through, Black could have caused an accident. The will to live outweighs the will to win. Black will have to try again another day. I knew we were going to lose a lot of ground around the time, but I thought so, so much horse on it. I said, gee, is this really happening? <laughs> Did the outside push me down a little bit? Yeah. Watch him hit the fence. Watch out for it. <laughs> she didn't hit it. She shied from right. it a little bit. She's smarter than I am. Oh, so confident. The fucking winner was Jordan. Nobody going to beat her today. No way. I wish he would have hollered to me, because if you're on a horse that's stopping real bad, it's not bad to get out of the way, you know. I'll, I don't want to drop anybody, and you never know when something like that's going to happen. You know, a hole like that, something could have happened, but uh, nothing did, luckily. Uh, you don't holler most of the time. If I'm on a horse that's still running, don't bother hollering, because I'm not going to move for you. But if I've been on the lead all the way, and my horse is, is stopping in, say, seventh or eighth position now, you know you're not going to finish anywhere, then let somebody else you know, go ahead and finish. You know, there's no reason that you have to cost somebody else the race just because you can't get there. I'm never scared out there. I don't think if you're, I think if you're scared, you shouldn't be out there. Uh, but it, it does concern you at times. I mean, there's times where you'll, you'll tighten up, you'll see a rider in front of you make a move that you don't think is the right, the right move and may cause some danger. And you tighten up a little bit and you, it can definitely concerns you because if something happens to him, there's going to be things that happen to the riders behind him too, and you you just want safety out there. And riders are very competitive. We fight for the same mounts. We do whatever we have to on the racetrack. But when one rider gets hurt, uh, we all have this common bond. And uh, unfortunately, falls is what it is. And we all fall, and we all know what it's like to be hurt. So when one, somebody gets hurt, you want to be there for them because you know it could have just as well have been you. Who wants to be a jockey in here? Oh, my God. <laughs> These guys want to put me out of a job, don't they? For 21-year-old jockey James Corral, it's just another day, just another race. He adjusts his equipment. He checks his riding weight. A jockey's life seems so calm and peaceful in these moments just before a race. Corral takes time to visit with another jockey, and then 
takes a long walk from the jockey's room to the paddock. In the paddock, he receives tactical instructions from a trainer before getting on a horse for a race. A race he would long remember. It's when they fall, it, they all fall differently, and some of them know how to fall and, and are just lucky to clear the horse. Clearing the horse is one of the major things. It's not really the fall. You know, it's getting trampled by the horses behind you or your own horse is the main thing, is getting underneath the rail and getting clear of the field, especially if you're in the front. During each race, we go behind the starting gate, watch the horses load, and then when we break, we break right behind them, follow them throughout the race, and uh, make sure everyone's on their horses. I think we're very much needed out here. It's, um, it just depends how they hit. A lot of times, they're, it, they, it could look like the most critical accident, and they'll get up and walk in the back of the ambulance, get checked out, and ride the next race. Or, of course, you know, they're put in the hospital, but it's really deceiving. Away they go. Shapiro's mistress broke well, so did Timely Willow, Ione and Bride, and going down there was Slay of Gold. Slay of Gold dropped the jockey shortly after the start. Timely Willow is now picked up the running and goes off the length and a quarter to Shapiro's mistress. At the rail, Ago Taras going pitchy. It is Ago Taras pulling her way to the lead. Close up fourth is Bald La. Well, James's horse, I think, was in the first hole, and a lot of times they like to jump at a it's a temporary rail and they want to go the opposite way on the track and that's what his horse did it jumped the rail and uh, never actually hit him it tumbled he went tumbling landed on his shoulder and his back and he kind of was complaining of back injury shoulder injury um, we put him on the stretcher and he started feeling better in the back of the ambulance on the way to first aid we never did transport him over to the hospital the doctor checked him out released him and he rode the next day he had a couple ice packs on his uh, foot and he had a couple facial bruises, but that's about it. He was lucky to clear the horse, you know, because a lot of times they roll right on top of him and there's a lot of injury. The horse just decided to jump the rail. Just wanted to jump the rail and I tried as hard as I could to straighten her up. And she jumped over the temporary rail. And as she did, I just, she got tangled up in it and I kind of was jumping off, getting, and I got tangled up in it and she both, we both got tangled up in it. But you're okay? I'm fine. Just a little sore. Corral was more than sore. He walked away from the accident, but the next day after the soreness persisted, he had x-rays taken of his back. And they showed he had a fractured vertebrae. Hole, that sleigh of gold, James Corral he went in the over the fence and bounced on his butt and, right and hard and, and turned. But it was the bouncing and the flexing forward of his body that cause the compression of the fourth dorsal vertebra. That's not an uncommon injury with jockeys. This requires some time. Uh, we got uh, studies uh, of the CAT scan of his problem, found the superior and inferior plates were both fractured, but no uh, retropulsion of material of uh, either blood or, or bony material into the spinal canal or, or any threat to the cord. The cord was perfectly fine. And he had no neurologic symptoms anyway. So now it's just a matter of getting the bone to heal and then starting him on a rehab program. But it'll probably still take him eight to 10 weeks to get back to riding. It, it can happen. And it happens to you sooner or later, most any rider. It's like the feet pen guy now that rode 49. He's hurt. And he's a, naturally a strong cop rider and takes more chances than any rider I've ever seen. But it happened to him too. Outside, here comes me and the drummer now inhaling the field as he turns for home. Wine Capades running on late. At the eighth pole, me and the drummer, cranky kid, wine capade coming on. Me, oh, and a horse went over the rail, sealed the deal, went right over the rail. Well, my horse was running on the lead, and uh, he never gave me an indication that uh, he was going to do anything wrong. I think he probably got scared when he saw the horses outside of him, and he got a little bit in tight, so he just veered to the left and jumped the rail, and I went right on top of, me, of him hit the rail, 
And then I went in the ditch and he followed me and he landed right on top of me. At the same time, I was trying to breathe because I, my, my lung had, had collapsed and uh, uh, I didn't know whether I was gonna get out of there in good shape, you know, like he was trying to kick me. And uh, at, at the time I was thinking, well, how I don't know I'm gonna get out of this one now. Well, there's no question about it that the rail saved me because uh, uh, it made me slide, which otherwise I would have hit the gooseneck, the gooseneck which support the rail, and uh, it would have probably killed me. Just weeks after his accident, Pinkai began his long walk down the road back to health. I heal very quick. I already had before. And this time it's been a lot easier. I don't have any pain. And uh, the, the only thing that, I have, that I'm worrying about is that I, I want to be in good shape. And that's why I'm getting up early and I've been jogging and, and walking every morning and, and getting on a lot of horses. So uh, I have plenty of time to get in shape. So I, I'll be, I'm, I'm going to be OK. To regain full strength, he exercised relentlessly. This, this helped me like when I haven't been riding for a long time and I'm, I'm, coming, I'm coming back from maybe an injury or uh, if I want to get fitter, if I, if I feel like uh, my, my legs are not that strong or my arms are not that strong, I do exercise over here. And I just move like I'm riding a race. From a trainer standpoint, one of the things that bothers you the most is when you have an accident, a rider's hurt on one of your particular horses, you know that you've taken his livelihood uh, for a while, even though they say that he's going to be all right and he'll ride again and everything will be okay. But you're concerned because you have cost him uh, days and days of riding, the thing that he wants to do, and, and a great deal of money. So I told Lafitte, I said, when you come back and you get ready, I'll put you on some live horses. It's a great boost for Lafitte. Really nice for him. As a rider, you know, you, you accept everything. You, you accept the pain, you, you accept injury, you accept death. But to have to spend the rest of your life in a wheelchair, probably from your neck down, that, that's something I don't think anybody's ready to handle, and I don't think I, I could live like that personally. But jockey Richard Megliori almost didn't have that choice. 
We had a spill at Belmont uh, recently at this meeting uh, where a horse fell throwing his rider, got up, and the instant he got up, another horse plowed into him at full speed. And you know, your first reaction is just to see two animals colliding at such high speed was horrifying, but you saw the jockeys literally flying up into the air, and you were just watching where they would land. Three riders were hurt in that race, and it's such a fluky thing. One rider was out two days, one was out two weeks, another's going to be out eight months. Uh, the rider was out eight months, Richard Migliori, it's always a game of inches. Had he broken a vertebrae that was a little higher up his neck, he might have been seriously paralyzed, and, you know, half an inch makes a difference. I was laying about fifth or sixth, turning into the stretch on the grass course at Belmont, and uh, the horse laying third bumped with another horse and fell. And there was two horses directly in front of me, and they saw exactly what happened, and they split. And when they split, the, the fallen horse was right in front of me. And my filly tried to gather herself as if she was gonna try to jump the fallen horse, and uh, she got up. And when she got up, my filly collided with her in midair. And her head snapped back and caught me right along here and knocked me out cold. And the rest, I just know from what I've seen on videotape, I might have flown about 30 feet in the air, and I landed face first on the grass, and I broke my neck. I woke up maybe 20 minutes later um, in the ambulance, just as we pulled into the hospital. And uh, I couldn't remember my own name, and I was very confused. I didn't know what had happened. And it was a lot of blood, and I, I looked down at the silks, and I re it came to me that I was a jockey. I still didn't know who I was, but I realized that I was a rider and that I must have been in a spill. And about five minutes after that, my wife had gotten to the hospital, and when she rushed in, I saw her face. It started coming back to me who I was. And then they started telling me that uh, a surgery was gonna have to be performed to repair my neck, and I was 50-50 to walk out of the hospital. Uh, at that point, I guess I was kind of dazed because I asked one of the residents when I'd be able to ride again. And he kind of got, I guess, a little aggravated at this and said, you know, laid out the bare facts. He said, you're very lucky if you walk out of here. It's very doubtful you'll ever sit on the back of a horse again. But uh, he says, if you walk out of here, he says, consider it like winning the Kentucky Derby. Because he says, most people with your injury, he says, wouldn't even be feeling anything from your neck down as of right now. When they told me everything was gonna be all right and I was gonna get out of there, then the only thing on my mind was how long is it gonna be before I could start riding again and, and I can start getting active again because I was still in head traction. He couldn't move, it was very uncomfortable, but at least I knew I was gonna be back. Migliore was back sooner than expected. Sideline for six months, he returned to win appropriately on Thanksgiving Day. If I've gotten anything out of it, it's an appreciation of what I had and, and how it kind of hangs in the balance. You, you know, you're that far away from winning or getting hurt, and you should always appreciate what you have because it's a, this is a great game that we're in, and at times maybe overlook the things that are really important and the special little times. And it, when I come back, when I win a race, I'm going to savor that much more, gallop the horse back real slow and enjoy that moment because you realize how precious it is when it's almost taken away from you. When I give it up, I want it to be my choice. I mean, I thank God that I'm okay and I'm walking and I, and I just hope that when the day comes and I get up in the morning and say, I don't feel like going out to the track and riding, I'll give it up then and not any sooner. Uh, I was heading there for the lead with Eddie Delahousie, the rider I have now, and my horse broke his leg. And there was one horse on the inside of me, one horse on the outside of me, and, and four more behind me. And every horse that was behind me fell, and fell over me or over my horse. So I was crushed both sides of my ribs, you know, on the left side and the right side. I had a punctured lung, ruptured spleen, and had uh, surgery for the spleen. Lost more hearing, which I didn't need to lose, and basically was about 20 minutes from dying. Well, on October 16th in 86, I was, in I was involved with a five-horse spill. 
Terry Lippum was riding a horse called Encolor. He was up there head and head for the lead, going a distance of ground, and the field was just going into the turn at the 3-8th pole, and, and Terry's horse broke his ankle and fell and caused kind of a domino uh, effect. And um, four more of us went, went over top of Terry and his horse, and I was the fourth one to fall, and Lafitte Pinkai was directly behind me. And um, unfortunately, we both landed in the same exact spot. I landed there first, and then Lafitte came in flying down on top of me, and the force of his body coming down on my left leg just broke the femur. My mother was listening to the races on the radio. It, they always broadcast a feature race, and that's what it happened to be, was the eighth race that day. And she called me and she said, Chris just fell off, call the racetrack quick. So I got on the phone, I called the track, and nobody knew anything. And then I started to get really nervous. And I called first aid, and they said, well, we can't tell you anything. All we know is that he went to the hospital and he was conscious. Well, I was thankful that he was conscious. I knew, well, it can't be that bad. At least he was, he was able to talk to people. And I knew I just had to get in the car and rush to the hospital. And I was driving 65 miles an hour down the breakdown lane because here it is 5.30 in the afternoon. And we do live in Los Angeles where there is a little bit of traffic on the freeway at that hour. And when I got to the hospital, there must have been 100 people there all looking like somebody had died. And that's when it really hit me. And all I wanted to do was see him to know he was okay, and nobody would let me see him. So um, I really started to get worried then. And finally, a chaplain came out. Now, I don't know whether this was good or bad, because he said, come on, I want to talk to you. I want you to sit down. And I thought, oh, he's gone. Yeah, that's it. Um, but he, he did say to me, he said, okay, we're going to let you see him in a few minutes. Um, he suffered an injury to his leg, but he's going to be okay. And I think when I saw him, then I felt so much better. Even though he was in pain, I just felt better knowing that he was okay. Three doctors uh, operated on me two days after the accident, and they inserted a what they call an internal fixation. It's a plate with uh, 11 screws that was attached to the outside of the bone to um, keep the bone in place so it could heal properly. And fortunately, it healed very quickly and, and very strongly. In storybook fashion, McCarran returned and won the 1987 Kentucky Derby with Ali Sheba, just six months after the accident. One year later, McCarran and Ali Sheba came back to Churchill Downs and took aim on the world's richest race, the $3 million Breeders' Cup Classic, a race they had lost by a nose the year before. alertly and 49er is moving right with him. Wap quite is out for the early lead now and Cutlass Reality on the outside. Ali Sheba's come out fifth and as they pass beneath the twin spires for the first time it's the gray New Englander Wap quite with a short lead. Slew City Slew is running right with them early. They're moving at a lively pace now. They've opened up five links on Cutlass Reality third. Ali Sheba is off the rail racing fourth. Then far the back, 49er has been taken back in fifth position. And the two Phipps color bearers are running together, seeking the gold and personal flag. Then a gap of four lengths back to Crypto Clearance, who's allowed to settle in an early gallop. And lively one trails the classic field as they make their way into the backstretch. Wah, quite pressed all the way by Slew City Slew. Those two continue as a speed duel continues on down the backstretch. Cutlass Reality is five lengths off them in third. It's another four.
Seth Hart. This is the moment that's worth it all. This moment atones for a jockey's hardships, the spills, the diets, the physical risks, the mental stress. Hey, hey, CJ. Just like I would have rode if I was CJ. Young. There are many heroes when a horse wins. It takes the horsemanship of the trainer, the innate desire of the horse, and the skill of the jockey. But it is the jockey who puts his life on the line every race, and that's their common bond. They know it takes a cup of courage. All right, CJ. All right.